Hello and a very warm welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching this special telecast with me, Frank Rausen Pereira. Towards the end of the year, there's usually a lot of talk around research and development in the science and technology space, starting with the Nobel Prize announcements in October. As prestigious and aspirational as the Nobel Prizes are, they are not and should not be taken as reflections or metrics of research and development in any country. This year, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry saw gene editing technology getting recognition and offered some good lessons for the global and Indian R&D community. What is the kind of innovation and research that we are seeing in India in pure sciences? How do we get more youngsters interested in science? And what are the salient features of the Science Innovation and Technology Policy 2020? We'll talk about all this and much more. And to do that, I have with me on the program today, K. Vijay Raghavan, Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India. Professor, thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you for having me. So let me start first with R&D because there's so much of, uh, you know, noise being made about R&D and, you know, the status really as far as innovation and research in the country is concerned. And since you're a biologist, let me start with pure sciences first. And how, how, how is the progress thus far? You know, this year has been extraordinarily unusual, apart from the pandemic and everything else, in that people not only want the fruits of research, but they also want research. There is a great appreciation of the value of science across the spectrum and how investment in science and technology at the foundational level can result in extraordinarily rapid translation at the time of emergency that we have seen today. Traditionally, the way basic scientists have argued for investment in basic science has been invest in us, don't ask us what we are producing in terms of impact. They will come in surprising and unusual ways over time. The answer to that at the other end of the spectrum, many people ask, particularly from poorer countries, that if that is the case, why should we invest in basic science in our countries? Why can't we use the decades, the centuries of basic science investment in other countries and do something useful over here? And then when we are rich, invest in basic science. What the pandemic has shown that it doesn't work that way. If you have investment in basic science in our context, then we can respond, be innovative, and do wondrous things with great speed. All of the dramatic things which have happened from personal protection equipment to vaccines, which Indian science has done in the last few months, has been because of our investment in foundational science. The damage caused by the pandemic aside, would you say that the pandemic has uh, come as, you know, uh, has brought about a lot of change as far as science is concerned and given us a shot in the arm uh, for basic or pure sciences? Yes, it has given a shot in the arm of the importance of science, but it's also a wake-up call to scientists to be much more interactive in normal times with our environment. As I said, uh, you know, scientists many quite often saw their job as doing things and the job of picking it up was someone else's. Uh, the pandemic has shown that that kind of a linearity is not necessary. You have an interaction with the environment which is constant. So we need to have structures now, which I think we can put in place, whereby we have a translation from basic science to satisfying immediate requirements done in a dynamic manner without compromising the diversity and inputs into basic science but at the same time addressing pressing questions and also the future. This is feasible, and the question is how to make it doable in short time, and that's something which I think there are interesting possibilities. Absolutely. You know, uh, one aspect when we talk about pure sciences, Professor, is the fact that, you know, there are not too many takers as far as, you know, the pure sciences are concerned, you know, biology, physics, and chemistry. We've produced great scientists India has a rich uh, history and heritage of produ producing some of the best scientists in the world. But if you look at the, you know, society at large, when you talk about science, you know, parents push their awards towards engineering or, you know, IT. 
And when, when, when you talk about science, that's the first thing that comes uh, to people's mind in India and not really physics, biology and chemistry. How do we change that? Well, let me give you three examples. The first one is from India. The second one is from Second World War Europe. And the third one, again, from India. First of all, if you look at the creation of the Indian Institutes of Science, Education and Research, they are primarily undergraduate and research institutions. Uh, that combination was thought to be unviable as most children would go for engineering. And the assumption was that the you know, people who couldn't get into engineering uh, or medicine would come to these places. That has been proven to be so far from the truth. Given a very large young demography, even if you assume that a large number of people are going into these kinds of areas, uh, engineering and you know, IT and so on and so forth, there are still so many bright people who want to explore basic sciences in multiple ways. Learn that and then perhaps go into the financial markets or management or science or whatever. But, you know, they are basically attracted towards science. And every ISA, the new ones, are filling up with quality students. So that's something. You know, I don't think there's a lack of uh, zeal to uh, uh, come to, to science. The second example is during the pre-Second World War days, particularly in countries which were going to be devastated by the rise of Nazi Germany, there were bright people who saw prospects in engineering. And Hungary is one example. And, you know, every top student in Hungary was urged by their parents to go into chemical engineering because chemical engineering was thought to have a great future. And the brightest minds of modern physics today, uh, you know, um, people like Edward Teller, Wigner, John uh, von Karman, uh, you know, von Neumann. Uh, these people all went into chemical engineering of various sorts uh, because their parents wanted them to get a job. Life was so hard. And then, through a subversive act, they all broke away and went into physics or, you know, fundamental research of various kinds. Um, and this was just astounding. So these people went to America and shaped the future of modern science today in dramatic ways. In a similar manner, if you look at our IITs, our top engineering institutes and so on, top Indian scientists who have come into basic science and populated both the top places in India and all over the world have actually come uh, in many cases through engineering. This is not unusual at all. So people will find what they like to do, what their inclinations are and do it. Parents will naturally push their kids to get something which is employable. And there are such large numbers that you'll find them in. Professor Rodham Narsimha, one of our top scientists, sadly passed away a couple of days ago. He trained as an engineer, but really at the heart of it, he was a fundamental fluid mechanics person who could analyze uh, the building of aircraft to the way weather patterns change. It's astounding. It's good, uh, you know, that, that, that things are changing on the ground and we are seeing uh, a positive trend, really. But, uh, you know, since we are here, Professor, let me bring in this other aspect too. You know, most youngsters then join the outsourcing industry and as a result, cater to the demands of other countries. Now, how do we stop that? You know, that's a very interesting point. Um, you know, you must look at three different components here. One, what most people do. Most people will naturally do where, go where the jobs are and there's nothing wrong in that. The second issue, which is a more worrisome point, is that these kinds of jobs are jobs which will change very rapidly as the world changes. And I'll give you an example of that. Both in terms of labor arbitrage, cost arbitrage, and manufacturing center-based cost arbitrage, the world has changed dramatically in the last few years. In other words, the value of a call center approach without a deep tech-end backup capability has steadily and rapidly gone down. 
And therefore, such approaches today have to be combined with more and more quality inputs. So, you know, it's not easy for the bulk to go into a kind of job with, where you really uh, don't have domain, deep domain knowledge. Similarly, manufacturing has changed because it's now easier to manufacture close to the site, manufacture components close to the site of big industry rather than manufacture them far away in India or Indonesia and then uh, export them from there. So that's going to be changing a lot. So these two things mean one simple matter. And here is where India can do something wonderful. The export of R&D has changed from actual export of goods and capabilities to the export of high quality design in everything from you know, semiconductors to shoelaces. Uh, you know, so design is the key and design combined with deep domain understanding is critically important in chemistry, in subtractive manufacturing, in additive manufacturing, computer aided design is going to dominate. This means a distributed uh, a job will be available. You can be in your village or you can be in a big town and cater to deep tech anywhere in the world. This requires an enormous input in training and facilitation. And that's what some of our missions are doing. The cyber physical mission, the supercomputing mission, and the soon to be announced artificial intelligence mission, the quantum mission, all of that push for this training on scale so that the enormous large demography of Indian talent will be used in a globally competitive manner. You know, uh, since you brought up AI, I have to talk about AI and let's dwell upon that for, uh, you know, for a bit, uh, Professor. You know, what's uh, happening really on the AI front as far as India is concerned? Because we've seen the kind of patents that, you know, small countries like Singapore, South Korea, Vietnam, or for that matter, even Taiwan. I won't go into China, but even Taiwan have, have filed. So, you know, uh, how do we change that? How do we become global players uh, as far as say, AI is concerned too? There are uh, an aspect of AI where government intervention is important and other aspects which government intervention is important in terms of preventing misuse uh, and you know, uh, having a regulatory uh, push over there. In other words, ethics and AI is a very important government role. Uh, regulation is an um, uh, important role and deregulation where it's required is an important role. All these things are happening in a big way. It is very true, indeed, that you know we've had big investments in many countries. Particularly, you've seen uh, China uh, having an enormous investment in AI compared even to the US and other countries. But this is a challenge, and this is not something to be belittled or ignored. But remember that that doesn't mean that one cannot do something truly innovative uh, and even brighter and better in certain areas. And as long as we choose those areas well, we can do that. At the core of AI, in addition to this, is data. How do you collect your data? How do you store it? How do you analyze it? How do you access it? And then how do you train? So the training sets and the volume and quality of data are very important. All these are being addressed here. And while I think there's no doubt that we need to pay attention to AI uh, you know, in a manner which is more effective, that is happening. But AI is also being brought into place in the functioning of government departments at the center and the state. So you're going to see a better use of AI combined with both ethics as well as domain understanding in agriculture, health, and so on. So since we are here then, uh, Professor, what are the fields of science where you see, you know, uh, short-term as well as long-term potential? You know, there are three important verticals which are short, medium, and long-term where everything we do should address. The first is climate, and I'll elaborate a bit on each of these. The first is climate change uh, and its consequences. So we need to address the mitigation of effects of climate change and also take efforts so that you know we still we, we change course the second is our environment uh, you know the zoonotic diseases such as what we're seeing today with the coronavirus uh, 
is something which will happen at increasing frequency because of our interactions with our environment in ways which promote uh, these spillovers. And the third is sustainable development for our people. So these are the three aspects which are at the core and everything we do in science and technology in India must address this because in doing so, we have the ability to address this for the whole world. Now, what do we do about climate change? Climate change has two components into it. What I said, mitigation. So there's a major international coalition which is driven by India called the Center for Disaster Re Resilience Infrastructure, which is looking at every aspect of our infrastructure, you know, from buildings to, you know, cities on the coasts, to pollution, to zoonotic spillovers, to cyber issues. What are the kinds of disasters which can happen in the context of climate change? And these are very important, health, agriculture, everything from this perspective. So that's going to be and must be a major area of research. How global warming affects our economy, our society, our health, and everything else. The second aspect with environment, you know, people think that this pandemic was a surprise. But scientists have been talking about exactly this kind of pandemic for a long time. But another kind of pandemic is likely to arise in addition, which we haven't been talking of sufficiently. And those relate to two things. One is the environment which you have created around us, the garbage dumps, the polluted rivers, the polluted cities, and all of that, allows spillover from those in a manner similar, but at a higher intensity and frequency perhaps, than our interactions in wet markets. Related to that is our use of excess use of antibiotics for every kind of illness, bacterial or otherwise, leads to drug resistance in multiple contexts. So a combination of a higher likelihood of spillover and the possibility of drug resistance means that there are potential dangers lurking. So we must pay attention to the environment in every way, uh, you know, both in terms of drug resistance, but also in terms of cleaning up the, the pollution which we have around us. And thir thirdly, in terms of sustainable development, the challenge is that we have to become a rich country without damaging the environment. All other rich countries today have the luxury of damaging the environment and then cleaning it up. We don't have that luxury. Many rich countries today became rich by oppressing their fellow citizens. We don't have that option, and we should not have that option. In that situation, how does a democracy have sustainable development without damaging the environment? The answer is using energy in sensible ways, having renewable energy and other kinds of energy which don't generate uh, greenhouse gases, and having devices which, from a, I'm talking from a technology perspective, devices which will use these energy in a manner which doesn't damage the environment, but reaches everyone. That combined with social and economic changes will allow a growth respecting the environment, not damaging, you know, not releasing greenhouse gases, but yet having development. And this is something India is doing and can do uh, as we go ahead as an example to the rest of the world. So, Professor, you know, uh, our friends at ISRO have been extremely successful, both from an economic point of view as well as from a, a project's delivery point of view in carrying out their work, is that a model that can be replicated elsewhere too? You know, it is a model, but remember that ISRO has not rested on that model. Just a couple of months ago, it's made dramatic changes. It's created a new structure called In Space. And in space is independent of ISRO, but ISRO will follow whatever instruction in space gives. And in space will interact with ISRO, with industry, with entrepreneurship to look at proposals which ISRO will then implement. Uh, you will either pay for it or you will have it have ISRO pay for it. But this is going to stimulate entrepreneurship and the private sector in the space industry enormously. Um, and in addition, uh, ISRO has created a company uh, called uh, Ensel, which 
will also take forward and commercialize. So ISRO has changed dramatically without losing, losing its foundational talent and capabilities. And that's what is going to happen, and that's what we need to do in other sectors. Learn from the way ISRO is focused in doing, and whether we are in a sector dealing with basic science or application and agriculture or defense, we do have a lot to learn from ISRO, but keep in mind that ISRO itself is changing uh, and has changed quite a lot. Absolutely. And I've, I've got about five minutes left on the program, Professor. I'd like to uh, focus a little bit on the uh, new science, innovation and technology policy 2020 as well. Your thoughts on the policy? Well, before I give my thoughts on the policy, uh, I should say that the policy is derived from another policy which has just been announced, which is the national education policy. That's an all-encompassing policy which looks at everything right from the school level to higher education in every month. In the national education policy, there is a major thrust on a national research foundation. Now, the science technology innovation policy looks at these as well as more details in the science and technology ecosystem. The fundamental issue at hand is a simple one. 90% of our research funding goes to central universities, research labs, and institutions where only 10% of our students go. 90% of our students go to state universities and colleges where only 10% of our funds go. The argument being made is that if we increase the funding in the state universities and elsewhere, there is no capacity to absorb. And the converse argument is if you don't increase the funding and you don't increase the footprint of science, we're not going to meet our needs properly. So how do you solve this dilemma? The way to solve this is through the creation of a new national research foundation, which will have mentoring sites across the country embedded in our universities, but getting the best people from our already established institutions and supporting these people to establish centers around them in different fields from humanities, from history, from languages, to science and technology and big missions. So this is something which is long overdue. This is being rolled out now. And this, along with the science, technology, and innovation policy, will, I think, be truly transformative. You know, uh, there's so much to talk about. Science is such a vast field. Uh, but we've got so little time. So my final two questions, I'm going to try and try and bring in two other important elements as well. You know, Professor, you spoke about uh, how the government has done so much really as far as uh, innovation and research is concerned. We're constantly changing, you know, new policies are being brought in, new ideas are being formulated. How important is it for all the other stakeholders to come on board and move forward if we truly want to be a superpower when we talk about uh, uh, design, research, and innovation. You know, what's the role of the private sector here? So, uh, thank you for bringing this up. For science and technology truly to be the fulcrum of social and economic change, it has to be strong and it has to be in the right place. When that happens, governments, people can lift any load. For this strong fulcrum, industry needs to play an enormous part. Right now, industry invest very little in science and technology research. Uh, and most of that investment actually comes through public uh, sector companies. There are some notable exceptions, but that's a situation. How does one remedy this? Industry is not that industry doesn't want to invest, but an industry does have capital. Industry's challenge is that it doesn't have risk capital because it has to compete nationally and globally. And other industries globally invest enormous amounts. The big uh, IT companies, for example, each one of them invest more than the entire U.S. National Science Foundation yearly in research. How does one compete then? So I think a partnership between industry and our research institutions to mitigate investment, uh, mitigate risk in investment is something which can be done and is being done. The Council of Scientific and Industrial Research is partnering with industry to create what are known as catapults in the UK, something similar here, so that big investment in deep tech, both socially valuable as well as economically valuable, is done in partnership so that industry's risk is mitigated. You're going to see more of this, and you're going to see more uh, industry research 
as we go along. You know, since we're here, Professor, a quick follow-up question, you know, how do we bridge the gap between all the stakeholders? For instance, you brought up uh, research institutes. So how do we bridge the gap between, say, for instance, uh, the industry on one side and academia on the other? You know, there is a term in electrical engineering called impedance matching. You know, you need to match, have equal resistance between two uh, connecting uh, wires, then the flow is not disrupted, right? If there's very rapid flow here and slow flow over there and you bring it together, it creates a lot of problems. Now, similarly, there has been a lack of matching between our academia and industry on both sides. It's not just on one side. Sometimes one moves fast and the other slow and vice versa. So you need these interface structures in between. And many of our environments, our city clusters, have created such interface structures. Uh, and these are, you know, tech transfer offices of high quality. This has happened in Bangalore, it's happened in Pune, in Hyderabad, and in the Delhi region. This allows you on one side to conduct your basic research unhindered, but have an interface structure which constantly interacts with industry so that industry's problems are solved here and your solutions are taken there. We have been experimenting with this over the last year and created four city clusters of this kind. So I think we're going to see enormous progress in this interface, which, has, which will have impact on you know, the three pillars I told you about, which need to be addressed, climate, environment, and development. And my final, uh, you know, uh, I, well, it's not a question, but you know, uh, anything that you'd like to say to young, budding, aspiring scientists out there who are watching this, how do you inspire them? Well, there's one simple point, and you know, this is not something to tell people what to do, but today there's an opportunity that whatever we do can have an enormous outcome on our people and people all over the world. Alternatively, we can do something really well, which satisfies us and you know, doesn't have any particular impact. So I would urge that all of us in these trying times focus on those activities where it brings us joy and we love to do it, and at the same time has outcomes across our country. One simple way of ensuring this is make sure that whatever we do, we do it well, but train 10 other people to do it well. And that way we amplify the possibility that wonderful things will happen. All right, Professor Vijay Raghavan, we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining me on the program and sharing your views on science in the country and how we improve scientific temperament in India. With that, it's a wrap. See you again next time.